Um, Demetrius Bertsimis is the Boeing Leaders for Global Operations Professor of Management and Professor of Operations Research and Co-Director of the Operations Research Center at MIT Sloan. He's a faculty member at MIT since 1988. Apparently, you finished school and immediately joined the faculty. Um, his research interests include optimization, stochastic systems, machine learning, and their applications. Recently, he's worked in robust optimization, statistics, healthcare, and finance. He's, he was the co-founder of Dynamic Ideas, LLC, which developed portfolios of management tools for asset management. In 2002, the assets of Dynamic Ideas were sold to American Express. He also was co-founder of Dynamic Ideas Press, a publisher of scientific books. Um, the, the, I'm going to let Demetrius introduce the members of the panel and give an overview of the topic. Um, however, it's a fascinating topic related to uh, optimizing performance within the operating room. And Demetrius, would you give us the 25 cent summary, please? That's an ambitious goal, 25. Good morning, everybody. I, very glad to be here. Uh, also happy to see that every year we have uh, an increasing uh, collection of people and the interest in healthcare increases. So uh, the topic uh, today is the use, uh, something that is uh, quite close to my heart, the use of uh, machine learning to improve outcomes for patients, uh, specifically in the areas of cancer and surgery. Uh, so the plan is as follows. Uh, I would like to give you, would like to give you some examples from our work. Um, and uh, so each of us will have some time, but then I would like to open it for questions after that. So is it possible to have the, the first collection of slides? It's me, right? <laughs> Okay, so I'd like to tell you a, a very recent topic. We just submitted the paper four or five days ago. So, and, uh, and it is joint work with uh, some of my students um, and a colleague, Nikos Trihakis, two of my students, and two distinguished physicians, uh, Roy Hirosh, who is a surgeon at uh, UCSF, uh, former president of UNOS, and Parsia Vagefi, uh, who is a surgeon at MGH, and very soon, in fact, starting tomorrow, he will, go, he will be at, at Texas. So, and it's the, the following idea, how to use machine learning for a very important life and death decision about who gets the next kidney, the, get, the, the next liver uh, for transplantation. Um, so is there anybody here in the room that has uh, particular expertise and knowledge on transplantation? Some. Okay. So the nation, since uh, 2002, has been using a particular system of uh, finding which is the, so you have people in the waiting list for, for livers. And uh, you need to, uh, in livers, it's not like kidneys that there's dialysis. You either get the liver or the outcomes are not good. Mortality is around the corner, unfortunately. So it is very important to allocate the livers to people that have the highest probability of death within three months. This is the topic we're talking about. And the nation, since 2002, has been using a particular system for, allocate, for calculating this risk called the uh, model for end-stage liver disease, which is a very simple but effective uh, model that in, involves uh, linear regression. You calculate three measurements from, from the patient, you multiply them with some numbers, and you calculate, you rescale, and this, this is a, a risk that you calculate. The person with the highest number, it's scaled between six and 40, the closest to 40 gets the liver offered, assuming it fits uh, from a blood perspective. However, what the, the people have found is that uh, Certain types of patients, particularly cancer patients that are in the waiting time, in the waiting list for uh, for uh, transplantation, have have been found to get less than their share. In other words, they are proportionally disadvantaged. 
So correspondingly, the nation through the, the, the UNOS, uh, which is the, the organization that uh, manages the, the, the whole system, uh, have found sort of ad hoc ways to give extra points, if you wish, to cancer patients to affect the balance. Uh, it has been going on for a long time, but in the end of the day, what is the key question? The key question is the following. What is the probability that a patient will either die or become unsuitable for liver transplantation within three months, given his or her individual characteristics? And this is not an abstract question. This is a question that might make the difference between life and death, because many people actually die waiting for a liver to become available. This is not an academic question only. So, uh, so the way we know how to, and this is what you will see throughout the panel, how to answer this type of questions. We start with data. And what is the data we have? The nation has had detailed information about transplant, transplantation data from uh, a long period of time. From 2002 and 2016, we know every single offer that was made, to whom it was made, what are the characteristics of the person, what are the outcomes, uh, we have this data. Um, all together, we had about 1.2 million uh, observations, offers that were made. Sometimes were not accepted, but we have all of this data. And the question is, given the data and the data alone, can we make a prediction, a more accurate model based on data about the probability of death within three months? This is a, a, a fairly crisp machine learning problem. What we want is to predict one or zero if a patient died within three months, and the uh, independent variables are variables, you don't have to read them, but they are examples like the albumin level, the serum bilirubin level. So these are data that you have, they're available. So, so this is uh, a reasonably big data problem, about a million observations to classify, and uh, so, we have, applied it, we have applied a method that Jack uh, and I have developed, a recent paper that appeared in Machine Learning, that uh, combines uh, two things. They combine state-of-the-art accuracy, but most importantly, interpretability, that is humans, uh, that is aspiration anyway, by looking at the, how prediction is made, understand uh, what is being predicted and how. For example, this is, uh, you know, th this tree says, here's a question, you might not see it very well, but the first asks, so here's a patient, what is the, the, uh, the so-called me the MEL score, the score that is currently being used. It's, it's interesting, but the method finds the first question is actually the existing, MELT. If it's less than something, bigger than something, then other questions are asked, and then in the end, as you go down these questions, you find what the probability is that you have, uh, that you will die or not. Yeah? People clear in the overall? Okay. So this method is, uh, what we have found is uh, quite accurate. In, in fact, uh, the, it improves upon earlier methods. And uh, I would say, the, so the green is uh, among many real world data sets, uh, I would say it's definitely state of the art on prediction, and it's only one tree that is interpretable. That's what I would like you to remember, that this is a tree that is, has high quality predictions, it is reasonably understandable by humans. But when we apply to this problem, we see, we call it uh, optimized prediction of mortality, MELT is the current solution, there's a technical way. So for various types of, of, of patients, for people that have no exceptions, namely they are not, for example, cancer patients, we have an improvement of, sometimes significant, of how accurate the method is for predicting, for unseen data, the, the, the probability of mortality, right? Sizable amount of work has entered that, but that's sort of the first uh, conclusion. But the question is, so this abstract story about uh, improving uh, prediction by two, three percent, what does it translate in lives? Right? How, because in the end of the day, this is what matters. So the nation has developed a system called, uh, uh, what's called ELSAM, Liver Simulation Allocation Model. It is managed at the moment at, at the University of Minnesota. 
Uh, and, and whenever a proposal at the national level is made, simulations are being made through this model. And based on this result, the policy of the nation is affected. So this is not something we developed. This is, a, uh, this is the, na the current national system. So we use this model to say, suppose instead of using the current allocation system, you use our own, the OPUM model. And, and what we have found is that it alleviates about 400 deaths in about 6,000 uh, transplantations. So, so what is the effect? The effect is by using more sophisticated state of art machine learning where you target what you want. It's not an intuitive ad hoc method. It is you, you take data, you systematically use all the data we have, and what we have found, at least in simulation, that it improves mortality significantly. Uh, it improves mortality across the nation in every single uh, area of the country. Namely, it's not an isolated effect. In fact, in the, in the southern United States, it improves by 23%. Um, so in addition, it alleviates, I won't tell you about the data, but it alleviates the key difficulty that, uh, of inequity. In other words, uh, cancer patients without ad hoc adjustments that have issues and so forth, you can actually um, it, it alleviates, not perfectly, but it alleviates, it's not the case that this method uh, gives preference to non-cancer patients versus cancer patients. So just to uh, tell you the few lessons learned from this exercise is I would like to emphasize interpretable machine learning methods for, for particular, particularly in healthcare, I think this is critical. Black box models, I cannot imagine that a, that a physician will use a black box model that you don't understand what it's, it says to make diagnosis and decisions. Um, I might be wrong, but that's my belief based on many years of experience. So I would like to have the first observation and we think that the method we developed has indeed this property. Uh, second is that machine learning models have an edge over intuitive models. This is an example and you will see some others. Beyond the technical aspects that it improves accuracy in a technical way, this translates in this particular case in saving lives and achieving more equitable allocations. And there's an implementation, I have the, the website, there's an implementation, you can very easily see the type of questions. It asks you a question about uh, you know, how to calculate the risk of mortality. So this is an example in uh, something that involves surgery, but where there's significant interest. So the second example that uh, uh, our panel would like to introduce, I would like to introduce to you um, Daisy Zuo. Daisy is a doctoral student at MIT and has wide experience in uh, healthcare as well as machine learning. And she will be talking about uh, how a, a tool that can be used using machine learning to provide estimates for mortality for cancer patients. Daisy? Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having me here. So today, the green one? The green, the big green button. Ah, the big one. Thank you. So this is based on a joint work with uh, some oncologists from Dana-Farber. The main um, motivation for this study is that many of you know that at cancer hospitals, especially at terminal cancer treatment centers, patients are treated aggressively with chemotherapy even when they're at the end of their cancer journey. Studies have shown that physicians often overestimate the prognosis and patient preferences are easily influenced by that. This could have some undesirable consequences, often leading to increased hospitalization and readmissions, toxicity, and subsequently lower quality of life for the patients, and of course, higher healthcare costs. So it would be really helpful for the doctors when they're trying to make the decision whether to treat or not to treat the patient and what kind of aggressive uh, level they want to use for the treatment to know exactly what's the personalized and individual level of uh, risk of mortality. 
So because this model is highly important, um, this kind of question is highly important, there has been a lot of previous studies trying to um, build such prognosis models. So you might have seen or used some of them um, for predicting breast cancer mortality, general cancer, lung cancer. So there's a lot of studies out there, and we actually did a comprehensive literature review on the existing studies. But we believe a lot of the studies fall short in one or two of the aspects, either in terms of data or method. For data, some of the earlier studies only rely on single center, um, very few patients, often under 500, um, and looking at very limited number of uh, covariates, often limited to 10 to 20 or so that uh, they can easily measure and keep track of. The methods that they use are also not really scalable and suitable for some of the data regime that we can see today. The linear models do not capture sort of the more nuanced nonlinear relationship across variables. For high dimensional data, it's unable to capture the, uh, the signal from the noise. And even if some of the recent advances in neural networks and deep learning models that they've been trying to use, it simply does not provide you with an interpretable output that physicians just cannot get any clinically meaningful output from it. We believe that our approach addresses both problems simultaneously. The data that we have, uh, we were, through our collaboration, we had an electronic medical record of uh, a total of 120,000 patients, of which 23,000 um, satisfy our inclusion criteria, covering a wide range of the past 10 years of treatment. Um, we have very accurate uh, measures on the mortality. Um, so our outcome is a 60 day, 90 day, and 180 day mortality. And what I think is really important here is that we were really able to take advantage of this rich data encased in this uh, EHR, where we were able to extract 401 variables, including detailed measures and clinically meaningful measures through our discussion with oncologists, such as demographics, treatment, and medical history, as well as lab tests and even genomic mut genetic mutations that eventually you'll see that many of them will become very useful in our prediction. We developed some kind of novel longitudinal modeling so it doesn't just simply capture what's the point uh, measure at this time when you visit the doctor, but really capturing the trend and the historical projection on uh, what has been, for example, the changing weight and albumin level. But with the data alone, it's still not sufficient to give us a highly accurate prediction model. We believe that we also need some of the modern advances in machine learning to really take full advantage of the data. So we use some of the methods that we developed within our group, uh, one of which for the data pre-processing. So with uh, Professor Brett Simas, a colleague of ours, Colin, and myself, we developed this optimal missing data imputation method that has demonstrated in real-world data has much better imputation accuracy as well as good performance in the downstream task. So this is what we use when we take this messy EHR data from the hospital and transform to something much cleaner and can be fed directly into a machine learning algorithm. For the prediction task for the mortality, we use that optimal classification tree that Professor Bersum has just introduced. And again, it combines the best of both worlds with both the high accuracy and interpretability so that it facilitates our, our discussion with oncologists and really iterate through the models and coming up with the one that's really clinically meaningful. I'll show you in the results that we compare with the other state-of-the-art method and how we, uh, how we perform in comparison. So a quick note on why we think trees are good models for especially medical applications. In addition to it being interpretable, I think there are two other reasons. Um, one thing is doctors are familiar with sort of tree-like treatment um, pathways and diagnosis procedure. So here's an example of the NCCN guideline for breast cancers where patients are stratified based on their hormone um, receptor status, her two statuses, and then the treatment pathway is uh, differentiated based on that. So doctors are already familiar with that, and when we present them with a tree-based model, um, they can readily understand the output. The other reason, I think, is that in medicine, there's a lot of nuances in these signals that we provide, and not all of them are linear. And here's an example from our cancer mortality data. If you see, we're stratifying the mortality rate based on the weight change. And on the left the most, the coral looking bar are patients with the most drastic de decrease in weight. And those are associated with the highest mortality, um, which is uh, intuitive. But that relationship is not linear. As you see on the right most, the pink bar, 
people who have weight gain are actually also associated with somewhat high mortality rate. So our oncologist collaborators hypothesized that this might be a, a, a result of edema, um, meaning that their body cavity and cells are accumulating liquid. Um, uh, it's corresponding to a weight gain, but not necessarily good for mortality. So this kind of nuance, if you use a traditional Cox proportional hazard ratio model, is not able to capture. But you'll see later in our tree result, that's nicely learned from the trees. Um, so Dimitri's already talked about why this optimal classification tree is better than um, some of the existing ones. And um, just to recap, the existing method are trying to learn a tree um, sort of greedily, just learning one variable at a time, whereas this method that um, Jack and Dimitri's developed really learn holistically what's the best split of the patient so that um, the, the results are highly accurate. We've seen that in real-world data that this method compare, performs uh, very competitively. So for this example, and this, uh, this tool is again available online if you want to look at the other result. I just took an example for breast cancer of the 60-day mortality prediction. And I just walk you through it. You don't have to see the details. Where basically, first the split is based on sort of the amount of metastatic solid tumor. So for a patient with very little, um, zero or one of them, um, they're split into, sorry, zero of them split into the left part for the lower risk group and further stratified based on their pulse and their age. For the, I think the right part is a bit more interesting for people who actually do have the metastatic solid tumor. Um, then they're further stratified based on their changing weight, based on their albumin level, changing weight again. So that, again, as I said earlier, captured this really kind of contrived um, and uh, and the subtle relationship for changing weight and the mortality. And you can see that patients in that group are further subdivided into the small risk group over there of almost 0% mortality to a high risk group here of 35% mortality. So for a doctor who are able to kind of put patient down this tree and then decide based on the prediction whether the doctor now needs to have a in depth conversation with the patient regarding end-of-life planning, that can be tremendously useful. What's even nicer about this is that once we have developed this intuition and understanding clinically that that tree did make sense, doctors don't even have to interact with that tree. It's simply a questionnaire where the answers are dynamic, sorry, the questions are dynamic based on your answer to the previous one. So the first example here for lung cancer, uh, first question is in terms of changing weight, and based on that answer, we further ask about albumin level. At some point, um, it's not gonna, the trees are not very deep, um, they just have to provide answers to, to um, six questions, and then there will be a very accurate final risk estimation. So again, you can go on the website and check out some of the, the interactive uh, component of our result. Um, we, did a comp we did a rigorous out-of-sample testing, and the, our, the optimal classification tree-based method uh, is one of the highest in terms of accuracy and area under the curve. So to conclude, sort of this simple example that I've demonstrated in cancer uh, mortality prediction, I think as now there is more push toward personalized medicine, especially in precision oncology, I think now we really need a, a, a good model, and this is one of the first examples, I believe, that really take advantage of the data that's available in the electronic medical record form and really put attack it with all the advances in machine learning algorithm and coming up with some Thing that's clinically meaningful and can provide the, the doctors and patient with something um, personalized and accurate. So with that, thanks. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, <laughs> the next uh, discussion is by Jack, Jack Dan. Jack is also a doctoral student at the Operational Research Center. Um, you've, you've heard already about uh, some of his work on optimal trees. And uh, he will be talking about some collaboration with the Mass General Hospital um, on surgery uh, and predicting mortality and morbidities. Okay, thanks for having me. Uh, it's exciting to be able to talk about some of my research. Uh, and like Dimitri said, what I'm going to be talking about is our work with uh, George at MGH on applying machine learning for surgical risk uh, estimations. So. 
as an overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, we have a lot of emergency surgery patients, and the diverse nature of these patients makes it hard to predict uh, what their risks are when they come in for surgery. And there are lots of existing methods that try and do this, but the issue is, is that they, they can rely on subjective data, doctor evaluation of the patient. Uh, they are not interpretable, a lot of them are black box models, or they're just not very good, they have low accuracy. So our motivation for this work was to try and train a model that was simultaneously highly accurate, but also interpretable, so that it could be used by physicians uh, in a clinical setting. And what we did was we used these optimal tree models that you've been hearing about to train uh, estimating uh, the risk of mortality and 18 other different surgical complications that could arise from the surgeries. And what we find is that we have significantly higher uh, quality of predictions compared to the existing methods, but most importantly, our models are highly interpretable um, and are suitable for use by physicians uh, in a real world setting. So to give some background, uh, like I said, there's over 130 million emergency department visits in the US annually. Uh, and over the last 10 years, there's been about 27 million hospital admissions uh, related to emergency surgeries. So it's a big problem. And the thing that makes it especially interesting is that it's a much higher risk setting compared to just a normal surgery. And so there are two goals we can have when trying to estimate these risks. The first is we can try and estimate the risk before the surgery so that the physician can accurately uh, sort of raise concerns to the patient and um, counsel them about what the realities are going into the surgery. Uh, the second part is that if we know the risk going into the surgery, we can look at the outcome of the surgery and use this as a post-evaluation process of how well a hospital is doing or a specific department in the hospital or even a specific physician to see if they're doing well compared to what sort of global or national averages say that they should have done in that surgery. And you'll notice in both of these applications, it's important for the model to be interpretable. There's, if the uh, physician just sits down with the patient and says, you know, your risk of mortality is 90%, it doesn't mean anything to the patient unless they can explain why we're coming up with this prediction. And in the second case where we're evaluating uh, after the surgeries, we need to be able to tell these hospitals, these are the areas you're doing poorly and this is why, uh, based on our interpretable models. So it's not good enough just to be accurate. We need to have this interpretability. It's the most important part. So the existing way of estimating surgical risk uh, nationally, uh, there are lots of different mechanisms, um, and they all use sort of the same kind of data, demographic information, lab results, uh, and various comorbidities that the patient has, uh, usually using logistic regression models. And the biggest one of these would be the uh, American College of Surgeons uh, Surgical Risk Calculator, and that's constructed using a database, uh, the NSQIP database, which has about a million surgical uh, visits every year sort of added to the database. And what you do uh, in this calculator is you input all of your patient information, uh, the demographics, what procedure they're having, and then it spits you back out the percentage, uh, the risk estimates for all the different conditions that it handles. And so there's a few problems with this, how it works. The first is that it's a black box. We're just inputting all this data into the calculator and it's spitting us back out these numbers. We can't understand what's going on under the hood. Uh, the second one is that it's a one size fits all model. We have to add in every single piece of information about the patient in order to get a prediction. Uh, and interestingly, sort of every factor contributes to the risk additively. There's no nonlinear interactions between variables. Uh, so if one thing is bad and another thing is bad, then together they're twice as bad, uh, which is not really how healthcare works. The final thing is that it's difficult to use because one of the pieces of information we have to specify is the exact procedure code uh, that the surgery is going to be classified under, which is often something that's not known ahead of time. Uh, it's sort of an artifact of the billing process. So what we tried to do instead was develop this model that would not only give better estimates of risk than the current calculator, but like I said, would be interpretable and understandable. It would give personalized predictions on a patient level, and most importantly, would be easy to use for physicians so that it actually has a chance of making an impact. Uh, and like the other work that we've seen, uh, we're gonna use this optimal trees method, which allows us to achieve both state-of-the-art accuracy and interpretability at the same time. So you've seen this before, this is an example of a decision tree. Uh, and 
I'll just briefly skim over it. The first split in the tree is whether they've had a transfusion. Then it looks at some lab results, the age of the patient, ventilation, uh, whether they're septic. And you can see at the bottom that there's various different stratifications of the patients, from those that have low risk of mortality, under 10%, all the way up to ones that are about 90%. So it's very effective at classifying the patients. Uh, and in the real world, these trees are uh, more sizable than this. This is just a cutoff version. Um, typically, it would require sort of six to eight questions to classify the patients down and get a very fine stratification of uh, the risk levels. Uh, to summarize our results, uh, we have sort of different tasks. We can look at just predicting the risk of mortality, and our area under the curve is uh, significantly higher than the existing calculator. Same for just predicting whether any complication occurs from the surgery. And then we also have these 18 different individual complications that can arise from the surgery, and our AUCs in those are as high as 0.93, which is very, very accurate. Uh, more importantly, like I said, is actually delivering this in a way that physicians can use. Uh, and so what we've done is built this interactive questionnaire that's suitable for use by physicians as a phone application um, to view the trees and understand the risk estimates. Uh, and the key thing is that uh, we, we've envisaged this sort of integrating with the EHR system to pull the data in where possible so that really the physicians only have to answer a few questions and they can get a highly accurate prediction of uh, what the patient's risk is. So as a quick run through of how it works, uh, Daisy showed a similar thing uh, where we are presented with uh, this application where we choose what we're trying to predict uh, and then we're presented with questions and as we answer the questions, new questions come up based on the tree structure, and these questions are dynamic because they depend on what the answers to the previous questions were. And then finally, at the end, we get this risk estimate for what the patient's uh, risk is in that surgery for that specific complication that we were trying to predict. So this is really easy um, for a doctor to use. Um, and I think the key takeaways from what I'm presenting, uh, there's two really. The first is that We've seen in all three cases that have been presented, this optimal trees methodology is general purpose uh, machine learning, uh, and it can deliver solutions that are both highly accurate and competitive with everything else out there, but unique is that they're interpretable. And in a lot of applications, this is not just a luxury, but it's actually a necessity to have an interpretable model. Uh, in this specific case, where we've been applying this uh, optimal trees methodology to predict surgical risk, uh, we can see that we improved significantly upon the state of the art in the area. And most importantly, we have this interpretability and understanding of what the model is actually doing, which allows us to achieve what our goals actually were, to deliver it uh, in an actionable way to physicians and hopefully have an impact on practice. Thank you. Jack. Thanks. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, my friend, uh, George Velmachos. George is the head of drama at uh, Mass General uh, for several years, and he has been an integral part of the team. So I would like to understand his perception of uh, this, this work, and uh, many others, as we'll see. Um, yeah, obviously for us uh, surgeons, for us physicians in general, I think that predictive algorithms are key. We base so many decisions uh, for the individual patient and for the healthcare system in which we participate as a whole based on our ability to predict what is going to happen, whether it is mortality or morbidity or some specific complication. So <clears throat> even if it's not as financially exciting as being able to predict, uh, I don't know, the, the, the horse winner on, on uh, Kentucky Derby or, or who's going to win the NFL, our ability to predict life or death, pneumonia or not, wound infection or not, outcome of a complex operation this way or that way, will certainly influence our decisions and the way we inform our patients. And in the big picture, um, how do we burden or facilitate the healthcare system? So it is important, but, but the issue that I'm struggling, Dimitri, and, and you guys here at the Sloan, maybe you can help us with that. The, the, the issue that I'm always struggling, and as we're going through these projects and so many other projects that we've done with Jack and your team, uh, is 
how much better are these predictive algorithms in comparison to medical expert decision? There is this problem always that as close as you are to the outcome, the better the predictability will be, right? Every fool can recognize somebody who will die in two hours. But it's very difficult to recognize who will die when one is admitted to the hospital just with a pneumonia, and then the pneumonia is re resists the antibiotics and then becomes necrotizing pneumonia, and then you do an operation, and then you develop postoperative complications, and then 40 days down the line, you die. It's very difficult on admission to predict this patient. So at, at what point these predictive algorithms will empower us to make precise decisions that are better than what we are able to make based on our own mental database? Every good physician creates a mental database over the years of practice, right? And you look at a patient, I think I can see a patient as one enters the door and say, this patient is not going to do well if I do this operation. And then I look at somebody else and I say, this guy is going to fly. And, and how does the predictive algorithm beat that? Um, this is one thing that I'm always struggling with. These AUCs that we showed, which are amazing, 0 0.091, 0 0.092, uh, I mean, no, 0 0.91 and 92. How better are the mental algorithms? Number one. Number two is, and I think Sloan is probably perfectly equipped to, to answer the second question because that has to do with health policy. If we do predictions and then we act on that, right? If, if I punch the four questions on, on the app that you create in Jack and it gives me that this patient is probably going to die with a 99% likelihood. Can I go to the family and say, this patient is going to die 99% most likely and, and I'm not going to offer an operation, I'm gonna let him die? What is society ready to accept? If you fall these stairs and I need to do CT scans, MRIs, and spend $1 million on you, this is because my clinical exam will probably be accurate 99.9% .9 of the times. So 99.9% .9 of the times, I will be able, just by touching your neck, asking you a few questions, moving your neck, I will be able to understand whether you will remain paralyzed or not after this fall from the stairs. But 0.1% of the times, I will make a mistake. And I will say, this patient needs no collar, he can go back to work, and as you walk out of the room, then your neck dislocates because I didn't pick up the fracture, and you remain paralyzed forever. And that's 0.1% chances. And this is unacceptable. If that happens to you, if I make a mistake one out of 1,000 times, then I get sued and I pay $10 million. And for that, for every one, every other of these 999 patients, I spent a million dollars on each one of them. I do CT scans and MRIs and I radiate your neck and I cause cancer maybe 30 years down the line and all this. So what is the health policy aspect of that? What is the American public ready to accept as the error of some close to perfect prediction? Thank you. Um, I'm hoping <laughs> on this question, I would like actually to ask back a question, George, about uh, what do you think about, uh, and, and the rest of the panelists, about education of doctors. I mean, people that have been trained uh, in, uh, in your case, surgery or medicine, they have not been fully exposed to, to this stuff. What is the role of education? And uh, do you feel that the current medical education could benefit from the introduction of these newer machine learning methods, et cetera? Oh, I mean, undoubtedly, it would benefit. I, 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 I hope that our new medical doctors are jacks and daisies, 
And, and as, a, as a father of an MIT student who wants to follow medicine uh, at the end of the day, I hope that he will be mentored by, by you all to, to understand these things that I don't understand that well. The question again is how much do we need or do we have time to understand? I mean, I, I, as you know, and I'm, I'm speaking to an extremely sophisticated audience who uh, I'm almost ashamed to, to tell you about medical or surgical, for that fact, training. But, but our training, you know, if you just fly through education and you go to four years of medical school and four years of college and then, and then you do six years of, of residency and then you do three years of sub specialty training, and then you do somewhere there in between another two or three years of research. So that's, that amounts for about 20 years of training. And how many things do we need to absorb in order to be good doctors at the end? Is it, is it that we create perfect doctors who are burned out as they go out into the market at the age of 45 after training of 20 years. You know, th these are the, the elements that we have to account for. And, and that's why we need to partner with you. I think that all I need to understand is the eventual app and, and punch the yes or no button and, and understand the significance of having such a powerful algorithm that obeys human variation as opposed to the old algorithms that didn't. That's all I need to understand. But the guts of it, I'm not sure that I will ever have time to learn. And when would you use it? I mean, every you, single time. You will use it. Every, I, I mean, as, as Jack was showing his, his last slide, I mean, and with three or four clicks, in such an intel, intelligent way I could have a prediction, I would use it every single time. OK. Uh, another question I have to my younger friends. Uh, so machine learning at MIT anyway, and in the world, has increasing exponentially. MIT recently announced the agreement with IBM. Uh, there are many other initiatives. It's fair to say that the field is exploding. Uh, um, so from all these developments uh, that people project that will affect our lives, what do you think are ones that will have perhaps the higher, highest implication to medicine and healthcare? Maybe Sure. Stacey, um, and then Jack, and then George. Yeah, so I think machine learning and artificial intelligence, more broadly speaking, is able to take advantage of largely unstructured data. And I think that's the key, right? You get all these images, you get physician nodes, you get genomics data in crazy high dimensions. And finally, like at this time, we're able to, to somehow at least have an attempt at getting signal out of it and maybe with some more, re more development in the future where we can synthesize it and getting it to a shape where it's really predictive and even can be prescriptive into the future. We're telling you what's the risk and what's the sort of best treatment for this particular patient. I think that would be sort of the future. And it will take a, a, a little bit more time with, you know, like more iterations and collaborations with clinicians to validate it and to really see if it's clinically accurate or meaningful. But I, I, I believe that's sort of the future. Yeah. Jack? I'm biased given my research. Uh, but I think one of the key things is interpretability. I think that. In a lot of cases, it's a luxury, but in a lot of applications, especially in medicine, it's a necessity to have this interpretability. There's a lot of research into things like deep learning, which are black boxes, and importantly, when they go wrong, we don't know why they're going wrong. We can't look inside and figure out what the issue is, whereas if we can look at the model and understand it, we can identify where it's not working, and that might help us to figure out what the next steps are, what new data we can collect. Uh, and so I think it's sort of, we're throwing caution to the wind if we're just taking a deep learning model, training it, and then blindly trusting the output. We don't have any way of sort of understanding whether it's learning structure in the data or just overfitting the data that we have. Um, so I think, I think interpretability is going to be one of the key things that uh, lets us know that these models are making sense and are sort of we can validate whether they're safe to use or not. George, I know you have, well, you spend your life in uh, treating trauma patients. Any specifics on this business of machine learning to trauma? Yes, well, um, I would like to point out in this audience, which is predominantly young people, that as gruesome as it's going to sound, my statement, that 
if you're going to die tomorrow, you're likely to die of trauma. You're not going to die from cancer, from transplant, from uh, uh, heart disease. The trauma is the dominant reason for death by a high margin for patients between zero and 45. The most dynamic part of the population is likely to die from trauma. And, and, and the problem with trauma is that it's unpredictable. And the outcome is totally unpredictable. Nobody has predicted that we'll walk out of this room and we'll get hit by a car. And if we get hit by a car, nobody has predicted the injuries. And if we know the injuries, very diff it's very difficult to predict the outcome. So this is a prime, as it's emergency surgery in general, everything emergency related is unpredictable. Um, so it, this is a, an area in medicine that I think your algorithms, you, your work will be extremely useful. Thank you. I would like to open it for questions. The gentleman. Yeah, I'll come close to you so you can. <laughs> Go ahead. Exactly. Well, oh, thank you. parallel processing. <laughs> Ideally, uh, everybody should have their surgery, uh, emergent or not, at MGH. When I was in residency, we used to call it man's greatest hospital. But the truth is that we have national data showing that after cancer and cardiovascular disease, medical error is the third leading cause of death in America. That comes to the issue of just how much we can absorb in these 17 years of training that follow college for a good surgeon, for example. The question is not quantity, but quality. And that's where this type of aid would be extremely helpful in uh, improving the ability of the doctor to make decisions. Because you know what we call the doctor who graduated last in his class? He's a doctor. But the fact is that we have a spectrum of quality, a spectrum of cognitive development that is only a reflection of the traditional medical school and residency training. The last time uh, medical school education was truly looked at was 1907 with Flexner. It's high time that we go back and think, how is it that we teach people to think in medicine? Because with this kind of tool, we could actually model more rational, more scientific approaches to decision making. It will be a great help. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I, I totally agree with you. And there is, I, I hope that my comment was not misconstrued. There's no question that highly capable physicians create, you know, uh, construct highly intelligent decisions. But there is a huge element of benefit in standardization. And this allows that. So, yes, you're right. But my, my comment on that is that in many other industries, sports is an example in which uh, if you look how, how sp general managers used to select the players, it was human intuition only. Uh, this has changed. M MIT Sloan has a conference on uh, sports analytics. Ten years ago, it attracted 80 people, the, the, exp the, the esoteric experts of the field. Now it's 3,000 people every year, including all the GMs. The field has changed. I actually dream of a time that, uh, and I don't think we are that far, in where the same thing will happen in medicine. Education, in my view, matters. That is, you have to educate the doctors, because if they don't understand it, they cannot trust. I wouldn't. Two, one more two, two quick questions. Yeah, Sorry, maybe two quick, two two quick more. questions. Um, for uh, Dr. Valmalos, um, I think you answered this, but you're not currently using this to change your clinically de decision making. This is used for counseling and for follow up for outcomes. And then in support of the first comment, as a regional CEO for a level three trauma center, to me this feels like the chess conversation from 20 years ago. This is not a plug for Watson. Um, but the grandmasters then didn't really need a computer assist to play like a grandmaster. And no, no, respect to you, you're a grandmaster. As I had good physicians at a level three trauma center, they would probably see more benefit from predictive algorithms such as this and be able to play closer to, if not like grandmasters themselves. They're very good physicians, but they're, as, as was pointed out, there is a very dynamic range of physician quality. So I would encourage the uh, PhD students to go pursue community or other areas uh, and see if your improvement or impression is different depending on the training and skills of the physician that you're partnering with. My only comment on that is that 
Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov. So it's, it's not, I think the Grand Masters can also benefit. <laughs> 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 One more. One more question. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Observation of two applications. One of them is there's a large prostate cancer database almost in the hospital where they have about 20 some millions of observations where they collected the tissue, the biopsies, the patients are going in and they're analyzing how the particular um, cancer tissue responds to whatever drugs were available. And prostate cancer within the last eight, about seven years, has been three major developments. And then what they want to try to do is put together cocktails, just not prescribing a single uh, medicine, but some combination of it. But that's one part where I think that this analysis would really help. But the other one is, is beginning to analyze the impact on treating the cancer on, on um, the intake of food, uh, the intake of vitamin supplements, exercise, weight training, et cetera. And not to criticize into the surgeon and even the oncologist, but it's oftentimes cut and run. And they don't focus on how to treat this after we. And you know, there's so much hearsay so that this type of technique could begin to sort out these variables as far as how much fat, carbs, et cetera, to use, exercise, et cetera. Thoughts? I mean, it just to me, it's. it's it's a gold mine there. We will to need to feed this model with the variables that you say, which we don't have right now. We get these variables from national database, and obviously they do not include how many minutes a patient exercises and how or how many vitamin supplements one gets. But I can see a, a time that we will arrive to this. OK. Well, Dimit Dimitri. thank you very much. Um, I mean, there might be more conversations in the corridors. Thank you, my panelists. Thank you for it.